Alex Kamal, head pilot of the Rocinante. I'm just taking a break from my romantic evening alone with the old girl to talk to y'all about some biology. See, uh, I'm born and raised on Mars, but physically I look the same as Holden or Amos. Is that right, or just a couple of steaming donkey balls? And with exception of one OPA hero, Belta Loda, look a lot like the Urters. So me pensa, what a human really look like if they grow up in zero gravity. You don't need to have watched The Expanse to understand this video, which looks at the medical challenges of very long-term space exploration. But if you haven't, you really should, because it's some of the best sci-fi around. Its creators, Daniel Abraham, and in particular Ty Frank, have won widespread praise for their attention to scientific detail. I've seen some fascinating videos and articles concerning the physics and engineering of The Expanse, but very little about the biology, and let me tell you, it is brutal. Now, I don't want to toot my own railgun here, but I do actually have a degree in space medicine, which has been of precisely no use in my 10 years as a normal doctor in London, until this moment. <laughs> All that studying for a YouTube video. If you're the kind of person that watches The Expanse, you're probably also the kind of person that's already aware of some of the medical challenges of going into space. Things like a puffy head, squashed eyeballs, loss of bone density, loss of muscle mass, but these are pretty much reversible. The longest any human has ever stayed in space is 438 days, and that was Valery Polyakov. This video is about entire lifetimes spent in space. Oh yeah, Beltalada. We're told that belters are tall because they grow up without gravity holding them down. Show producer Naren Shankar explained the realities of producing an already expensive show meant that it wasn't feasible to cast only very tall Marfanoid actors or to digitally elongate every belter. But the books tell us that belters are tall, skinny, and completely ill-equipped to deal with Earth's gravity. Humans do stretch out in space. Typically, the average astronaut coming back from the International Space Station will be about two or three centimeters taller than when they left, but remember that every astronaut we've sent up there has gone as an adult, they've grown up in 1G, so removing gravity temporarily from their spine naturally allows it to elongate slightly. But what we need to think about are babies, and what their spines would look like if they actually grew up in space. Ever seen an x-ray of a fetus? You'll notice huge gaps. This is soft cartilage that is ossified during your early years. Osteoblasts are types of cells that produce bone, and osteoclasts break it down. Normally the two work in perfect balance, your skeleton is completely replaced every 10 years or so. Impact stimulates osteoblasts, and gravity is an important part of this process. Repeated impacts promotes higher bone density and growth, which is why pediatricians recommend high impact exercise like skipping or running. It's why squash and basketball players have amongst the strongest bones of all, and tennis players have higher bone density in their playing arm compared to their non-dominant arm. Without gravity, stimulating osteoblasts, the creators, can be very difficult. And the activity of osteoclasts, the destroyers, outstrips them, and bone can be very rapidly broken down. For a growing child, this could be catastrophic. In fact, without gravity, it's possible that we might see a form of space rickets. Rickets is sadly still seen in many poor parts of the world. Caused by vitamin D, calcium, or phosphate deficiency, it causes bones to grow misshapen and a host of other problems. Martians and belters would receive far less sunlight than people on Earth, meaning they'd produce less vitamin D. Now, we can replace that in their diet, but we'll struggle to control the dysfunctional calcium metabolism without gravity. Belter children may be short, deformed, prone to kidney stones, digestive problems, and may even have learning disabilities. I am that guy. Muscles atrophy, or waste away in space, because they don't really need to do any work. The combination of a brittle, osteoporotic, demineralized skeleton and weak, unused musculature mean that the torture scene, where a belter is just hung from hooks in Earth's gravity, is probably very accurate. Belters might not even be able to maintain full consciousness on Earth. Their circulating blood volume would be less, as in microgravity, fluid redistributes into the center of the body, fooling pressure receptors into thinking there's too much fluid on board and excreting water. The most important muscle of all also atrophies, your heart. The heart becomes rounder and smaller in space as it no longer has to do any work against gravity. A cardiovascular system that has grown up in microgravity might be completely unable to generate enough pressure to pump blood to the organs, potentially causing a belter to go into cardiogenic shock, blackout, and then suffer multi-organ failure. 
nice. Space agencies use things called countermeasures to try and reduce the amount of damage caused to astronauts in space, things like making them work out for two hours every day on the International Space Station, or giving them an intravenous infusion of fluid as soon as they return to Earth. But these are obviously temporary fixes, and they won't work with kids who've grown up their entire life in zero gravity. I've tried to put a newborn baby on a treadmill. Believe me, it wasn't a pretty sight. Here comes the juice. So what about the juice? that's injected into people to protect them from hygiene maneuvers. I came up with some candidates for constituents of a juice using modern medicines, but by my reckoning, we're still at least a few decades off an effective mixture. Someone's alive in here. The central nervous system is affected by microgravity. The amount of spinal fluid changes, the neurovestibular balance system gets messed up, gray and white matter composition changes, and cognitive abilities are reduced. It's possible that a brain growing in a low gravity environment would be very weird. Even if our poor belter can maintain consciousness on Earth, they'd probably just stumble around like a drunk. Just keep at it. NASA and Roscosmos both state that nobody's ever had sex in space, but we have studied human sperm. Well, no, they don't ask the astronauts to contribute. Jeez, I mean, that's disgusting. Can you imagine the mess? Ah! Sperm swims faster in space, which may sound good, but faster is not better in this case. Sea urchin and bull sperm were observed to initiate movement abnormally fast and have problems with the process necessary to fuse with the egg, meaning that fertilization might not even be possible. Many species have reproduced successfully in space, but the only mammals to get pregnant in space, rats, both miscarried. When you're studying space sex, who else do you want to partner with except SpaceX. Yes, a Falcon 9 supply mission took bull and human sperm to the International Space Station earlier this year, where these exact steps in a sperm's life cycle will be studied. You can see men in the team responsible here. Hilariously, because Simpsons creator Matt Groening is friends with the lead researcher, he was actually commissioned to design the mission patch. Unless we find a way around these problems, we won't be able to reproduce in a weightless environment. We also don't have any idea if a fetus would even grow normally in microgravity or if a natural childbirth would be possible. But once again, The Expanse has actually thought about these issues. The books and show explain how belters often travel to Ganymede Station to conceive and raise young children. The small amount of gravity might help. Ganymede's magnetosphere, unique amongst moons in our solar system, is also mentioned as a way to protect from radiation. You catch up, I'll wait. Cosmic radiation could be catastrophic for reproduction. Mice subjected to radiation similar to that found in space had irreversible damage to their ovaries and premature menopause. It's a commonly repeated myth that humans are no longer evolving. You can find one example in my previous video about Himalayan Sherpa. So we may well evolve if born and raised in space, but there's something that might give us a huge kickstart or just give everybody cancer. Outside our protective Van Allen belts are lethal doses of radiation. We know shielding's been developed in the expanse, but I think we can assume that people would not be 100% shielded at all times. In Caliban's War, we hear of an immunodeficiency syndrome called Maya Skelton Premature Immunosenescence, and it's speculated that low gravity or radiation could be responsible. I really like this storyline. If it was included just as a plot device for the protomolecule, it's very clever. Premature immunosenescence is a phenomenon where the immune system ages faster than it should, and it's seen in conditions like chronic stress and chronic inflammation, which I think it's fair to say would be common in the resource-poor outer solar system. This produces long-term cortisol elevation, reduced T-cell activity, and elevated pro-inflammatory blood markers. Chronic inflammation also shortens your telomeres, and this is bad news as we know that telomeres do strange things in space. Chronic stress and inflammation also negatively impact the thymus, which is a key organ in the immune system. We haven't seen this issue with any astronauts so far, as the thymus is most active when you're a child. By your teenage years, it starts to shrink and effectively disappears completely. Impoverished belters can't afford the expensive oncocidals or anti-cancer medication that we hear is used to treat radiation in the show. Is this realistic? This question is basically asking, will we find the cure to cancer? The simple answer is, we don't know. The complicated answer is we already have for some cancers. Cancer is not one disease. It affects different organs in different ways. So it's quite possible we'll find a cure to radiation induced cancer of a particular organ, but it's unlikely we'll have any medications you can take preemptively after having been exposed 
to radiation. For me, that seems even more futuristic than the Epstein drive. Finally, whatever physical traits are taken on by Martians or Belters might not be passed on to younger generations if they can even have kids. As Darwin and Wallace stated when first describing evolution, if an animal loses a leg, its offspring are not born with a missing leg. However, we know from Scott and Mark Kelly's famous twin study that genetic expression can change drastically in space, as with any high stress environment. And it's conceivable that genetic changes might occur in gametes. So your guess is as good as mine as to what a 10th generation outer would look like. The Expanse raises many real questions about just how difficult it will be for the human race to colonize space. However optimistic Elon Musk is, becoming a multi-planet civilization will be the hardest challenge the human race has ever undertaken. Still, worth a try. Okay, we do pensa, do man. God damn it, Amos. What did you do?